again, ladies and gentlemen, this will be set six of our internal medicine review questions. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of this video and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos coming and free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies as well as how to form a, uh, form a differential diagnosis and a treatment plan, things that will come in useful for you as you gear up to study for step three in the clinical case studies that come on the USMLE, which as you may know are not multiple choice questions. It's also good for developing a systematic way to approach patients in real life. So thank you very much in advance for your support. So question one and question two will sort of be the same patient and you'll want to answer question one before moving on to question two because on the USMLE you'll get these types of questions where they'll ask you to answer one of the answer the first question and then you won't be able to go back and answer the second one. They're just trying to see if you can think in a sequential way. So we have a 55 year old woman presenting to the clinic because of multiple growing nodular lesions on her face. She is a recent immigrant from Burma, uh, that's in Southeast Asia, and has never been seen for this before. She says that the lesions have been there for about four years. The lesions are not painful. Physical exam reveals decreased sensation of the hands and feet bilaterally. Biopsy of the lesion reveals foamy macrophages with numerous acid fast bacilli visible within. Cultures of the lesion on blood agar reveal no growth after one week. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? A. Tuberculoid leprosy. B. Lepromatous leprosy. C. Mycobacterium avium complex infection. D. Isolated tuberculosis. Or E. Tertiary syphilis. All right, I'll give you the opportunity to pause here if you'd like to read this question and consider your answer. And then we will go on to question two. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? A. Dapsone, B. Dapsone and rifampicin, C. Dapsone, rifampicin, and clofazamine, D. Isoniazid, or E. Isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Okay, so you can pause here if you want to look at this one. So going back to question one, what's the most likely diagnosis? Oops, there we go. And the answer to that is lepromatous leprosy. So what is our chief complaint here? We have nodular lesions on the face. And what else do we find? Well, what about these nodular lesions? Well, they're not painful. They've been there for a very long time. And they're getting worse. So there is some kind of an infection going on here. This is probably not cancer. Uh, because there's multiple lesions, and usually skin cancer will be a singular lesion. Um, it's probably infectious uh, because when you get the biopsy of the lesion, pretty much every skin lesion, you don't know what it is, you're going to biopsy it. And when you get the lesion, you see that there's macrophages and there's bacteria inside the macrophages. So that's a pretty good indication that this is an infection. Now what kind of bacteria are inside the macrophages? Well it's acid fast bacilli. What are acid fast bacilli? Pretty much everything from the genus Mycobacterium is going to be acid fast. So that's Mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium avium, mycobacterium leprae, etc. And that makes up A through D. So, um, in addition to all of this, we see that there are neurologic signs. So, she has decreased sensation of the hands and feet bilaterally. What do we call that? We call that a stocking and glove peripheral neuropathy. And that happens to come with one particular disorder that is associated with acid fast bacilli. What is that? That's leprosy. And not only is it just leprosy, it's lepromatous leprosy. So this is a picture of lepromatous leprosy. We're going to talk about the difference between tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy, 
But the main difference between tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy is that lepromatous leprosy is widespread and the lesions are nodular, whereas with tuberculoid leprosy the lesions are flat and they're usually numb and hypopigmented. With lepromatous leprosy, this is what we think of when we think of leprosy. When you look at the Bible, which talks about leprosy and the leper and how they were shunned, they weren't shunned because they had a white patch on their skin, they were shunned because they were disfigured. And lepromatous leprosy is disfiguring, whereas tuberculoid leprosy, you just get this sort of dis, uh, depigmented patch, which doesn't look a whole lot different from from uh, psoriasis. So that is the difference between lep lepromatous and tuberculoid. Why not mycobacterium avium complex infection? So there are a couple reasons why it's not that. Uh, first of all, who gets mycobacterium avium complex infections? Does that happen in the United States? Well, leprosy really doesn't happen in the United States. We only get a few dozen cases a year, really. Uh, does mycobacterium avium complex happen in the U.S.? Well, it sure does, uh, but who gets it? AIDS patients get it, and we don't have a whole lot of AIDS patients that much anymore because of, uh, because of heart therapy. Uh, but it is a possibility. But this patient does not have HIV AIDS, as far as we know, and mycobacterium avium, although it is acid fast bacilli, it does not give this picture. It doesn't give skin lesions. Mycobacterium avium will be a pneumonia in an AIDS patient with fever and lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly. So that's not what this is. You don't healthy people don't just get Mycobacterium avium complex. It's an opportunistic pathogen. Isolated tuberculosis. This is uh, tuberculosis is not going to give you a, a rash like this or a, a nodular lesions like this. Uh, isolated tuberculosis does occur, it would be something like POTS disease, but tuberculosis ultimately is going to cause uh, lung issues. Um, but uh, it, this is not tuberculosis. What, the reason I put that as a possible answer choice is to trip you up, and USMLE will do that. They'll s say, okay, well, we have acid fast bacilli, and most people know that one of the acid fast bacilli is TB, and so you'll think acid fast bacilli, TB, and choose D, and that's not the right answer. TB is not the only acid fast bacilli. And then tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis can look a little bit like this. Uh, insofar as you get these lesions on the face. What do we call those lesions on the face in tertiary syphilis? It starts with a G. Gummas, or gummas, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, so these gummas are, they look kind of nodular, but a lot of times they'll ulcerate. And when you get a, when, when you get a, a, uh, a biopsy of a gumma, uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, these sort of granuloma looking, uh, this a sort of granuloma with with uh, coagulative necrosis in the middle. Uh, you're certainly not going to see acid fast bacilli because what is syphilis caused from? Syphilis is caused from a gram negative spirochete. It's not an acid fast bacilli. So that rules that out. So leprosy is a slowly progressive infection caused by Mycobacterium leprae. Mycobacterium leprae is a gram-positive pleomorphic acid fast rod. And it is impossible to grow on artificial medium. So see where I said uh, culture of the lesion on blood agar reveals no growth after one week? I could have said after one year or one century and you would have still had no growth. Um, this particular... Uh, Mycobacterium leprae is endemic in uh, the developing world, particularly in Southeast Asia, in Brazil, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. As a matter of fact, the majority of cases occur in India, Brazil, Burma, Indonesia, Madagascar, and Nepal. So usually, it, uh, well, okay, and this is also important, primarily it affects the skin and peripheral nerves, uh, for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Usually it's transmitted via infected respiratory secretions, and it works a lot like TB, the way it's transmitted. It's taken up by alveolar macrophages, and it is disseminated hematologically. And it, this particular bacterium likes to 
proliferate in cooler tissue, usually between 90 and 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not going to affect the vital organs, not going to affect the lungs, it's just too warm. So it's going to go to the skin, which is a little cooler. It's going to go to the testes, to the eyes, to the nose, uh, to connective tissue. It's, it, it really is not going to affect the, the, uh, the heart and lungs and GI tract. Uh, so it prefers cool tissue. As I said, it's not common in the U.S., only about 100 cases in the U.S. per year, and most of those are going to be immigrants or perhaps, uh, perhaps native-born Americans who traveled to endemic areas for, like, mission trips. Um, 210,000 new cases per year worldwide, though, so this is certainly something uh, that, that you'll run into if you're practicing global medicine or if you're one of my viewers that practice outside the United States. So there's, we already kind of talked about the difference between tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy, tuberculoid leprosy being more localized, usually resulting in a skin lesion, which is kind of well-defined, as you can see here, hypopigmented, uh, with diminished or absent sensation. As we're going to see in, a, uh, in the next slide, uh, I have a picture. It can look a lot like psoriasis. Uh, the difference between this and psoriasis is that uh, the leprosy plaque is going to be, uh, you're going to have a loss of sensation, whereas a psoriasis plaque is going to be painful and you certainly won't lose sensation. Uh, tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy are sort of at opposite ends of a spectrum. So tuberculoid leprosy can be on the more severe end uh, while still being tuberculoid or perhaps you may call it borderline uh, where it can affect nerves. And so usually these nerves that it will affect will be more superficial nerves, these nerves that run closer to the skin. Uh, so we're not talking about like the femoral nerve here, we're talking about nerves like the ulnar nerve, which sit pretty close to the edge of the elbow. Um, other nerves may be the greater auricular nerve, uh, the posterior tibial nerve, or the peroneal nerve. And coincidentally, those nerves primarily uh, innervate the, the ends of the extremities, and that's why you get... Uh, with lepromatous leprosy, where all those nerves are highly affected, that's where, why you get that glove and stocking neuropathy. Uh, you may have one of those nerves affected with tuberculoid leprosy. It's certainly possible, but usually tuberculoid leprosy is just going to be this, this plaque and maybe a nerve involved. But certainly this plaque is going to have diminished sensation. Lepromatous leprosy is much more disseminated. The skin lesions are more nodular like this. They're kind of rubbery. And, um, and, and usually you're going to have much more uh, extensive nerve involvement. Uh, with with this, this facial appearance, it can break down the collagen uh, and, and the, the, uh, the, the structure of the nose, and you can get a saddle nose deformity. We call this a leonine facies. They look like a, like a lion face. I don't see that, but I guess it kind of if you watch The Wizard of Oz, kind of looks like the cowardly lion a little bit, maybe. I don't know. Uh, it's not the name I would give it. Uh, it can affect the, the anterior chamber of the eye, which can lead to blindness. The peripheral neuropathy can be really bad, ca causing that uh, glove and stocking neuropathy. That, can make, uh, that loss of pain sensation can cause multiple trauma, secondary infections, which can lead to contractions and uh, ultimately autoamputation of digits. Uh, coincidentally, uh, this leonine facies, you can also see it in other things, not just leprosy. You can see it in, um, uh, in a cutaneous lymphoma as well. Okay, so um, that's all I have for you for that. Oh, and then, so why is it that some people are exposed to M. leprae and get tuberculoid leprosy, and why do some people get lepromatous leprosy? It's the same pathogen. Well, it just so happens that some people are able to mount a response against tuberculoid or against uh, Mycobacterium leprae. So if you are able to mount a better cell-mediated response, you're more likely to get the tuberculoid version. Whereas if you're not able to mount a response, and this is really just the genetic lottery here, then you're more likely to get lepromatous leprosy. So it's really just uh, the, uh, your, your genetic luck. There's not a whole lot of research, not a, not a whole lot of uh, knowledge out there as to why some people get tuberculoid, some people get lepromatous. I don't think it has anything to do with the severity of the strain. Uh, right.
I think. Oh, and then one more thing I wanted to add. With Lepromatous Leprosy, one of the big problems from this is that your B cells can actually mount an immune response, but antibodies aren't going to be useful against M. leprae. And what can actually happen is you can get uh, immune complex formation, and that can clog up your kidneys and cause glomerulonephritis, can clog up your vasculature and cause vasculitis, uh, and so that can lead to a big problem as well to make matters worse. To diagnose leprosy, you do a skin biopsy like we did in our vignette, or you can do PCR. Uh, there's something called the Lepromin skin test. It works very similar to the PPD that we use in TB, but basically what we're doing here is we're determining how well a patient has a cell-mediated immunity to leprosy. So uh, you inject the antigen into their skin and you see what their response is and if they have a good cell mediated response what that means is that they're more likely to get what kind of leprosy tuberculoid leprosy because they're mounting a response to m leprae whereas if they don't have a response then they're more likely to get or to have uh, uh, lepromatous leprosy and so it's really good, a good prognosticator the treatment for leprosy depends on the type. So if they have tuberculoid leprosy, you do dapsone and rifampicin. And if they have lepromatous leprosy, you do dapsone, rifampicin, and clofazamine. So three drugs. So this is a multi-drug therapy. And so that gives you the answer to two. Because this patient had lepromatous leprosy, you need to do the three drugs, dapsone, rifampicin, and clofazamine. You'd never do dapsone alone. Dapsone and rifampicin would be fine if this were tuberculoid leprosy. C is the right answer. Isoniazid would be a patient with, uh, with, with, who had a positive uh, PPD test, uh, and so you would give isoniazid for, for nine months. And then, and then isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol would be a patient with active TB. So this is the, the leonine facies uh, in a patient with lepromatous leprosy, two different patients here. Uh, here's a contracture of the hand. Uh, this, this happens with repeated trauma, uh, which will usually occur in the setting of peripheral neuropathy. And then here's autoamputation of the digits. You can see what appear to be lepromatous plaques and injury here. This would be your typical lepromatous plaque that you would see in tuberculoid leprosy. Usually you'll just have a couple of these. Uh, notice the hypopigmentation. The, the center is much less pigmented than the surrounding skin, and then you kind of have this surrounding erythema. Notice how close this looks to psoriasis, very similar to psoriasis. What's going to set this apart is that it's going to be uh, numb. Uh, on the lesion. There's going to be diminished sensation. Uh, this is pathology. If you're taking step one, you may want to be aware of this. So this is lepromatous leprosy. Here you see these macrophages that are now these sort of foamy histiocytes. Uh, we call these lepra cells and usually inside if you do a, a, a zeal nielsen stain which looks for acid phosphosoli you'll see the acid phosphosoli within these macrophages. Notice that there's very few uh, to no lymphocytes as far as I can see on here. Uh, if you do, if, if you zoom out from this, and I couldn't find a real good picture, uh, you'll notice that you have just very poorly circumscribed masses of, of macrophages. So this is the zeal nielsen stain uh, where you can see uh, that you've got here uh, these little red snappers, and these are the uh, mycobacterium. Notice here you have lots of granulomas. This is the granulomas are a result of cell mediated uh, response, and so here you're containing the mycobacterium, and so this is tuberculoid leprosy. Uh, there'll be a tendency. Uh, for these uh, histiocytes to uh, surround small cutaneous nerves. And um, the granulomas are just uh, well differentiated epithelioid cells that are surrounded uh, and penetrated by lymphocytes. As you can see here, this is a beautiful granuloma. You see lots and lots of lymphocytes surrounding uh, these uh, 
uh, these cells here with a little bit of penetration. You don't need to know this stuff in and out for st uh, step two and step three, but if you're taking step one, you'll want to read a little bit more into the, these, this pathology. All right, question three gives us a 58-year-old man presenting to the clinic complaining of worsening tremor in his left hand for the past six months. The tremor is noticeable when he is resting and improves when he moves his arm. He's concerned because his golf game has been struggling and he's dropped his coffee a couple times in the last week. His wife notes that over the same period of time, people have noticed his voice has become, quote-unquote, much quieter, and she often needs to remind him to speak louder. Physical exam is significant for increased resistance to passive motion of the wrists, arms, and neck. Uh, mini mental status examination is normal. Vitals are within normal limits. His past medical history is significant for type 2 diabetes and acute angle closure glaucoma. When considering medical management, which of the following drugs should be avoided in this patient? A. Levodopa, B. Selegiline, C. Memantine, D. Entacapone, or E. Benztropine. Alrighty, I will give you a chance to pause here. And our answer is... Benztropine. What kind of drug is benztropine? Benztropine is an anticholinergic. And what is one of the contraindications for an anticholinergic? It's in his history. Acute angle closure glaucoma. Benztropine will reduce the flow of aqueous humor out of the eye, and that will increase the intraocular pressure and put him at risk for a glaucomic episode. So we cannot give this patient benztropine. A history of angle closure glaucoma is a contraindication for benztropine, as well as trihexaphenidol and some of the, all the other anticholinergics. We want to avoid that in this patient. Now all these other drugs are, uh, actually all of these drugs are used uh, to a certain degree in patients with uh, with Parkinson's disease, which is this patient's diagnosis here. We know that this patient has Parkinson's disease because of his history. So uh, the, the most, uh, I mean, obviously there's the tremor. Uh, and this is a resting tremor. It's uh, noticeable when he's resting and improves when he moves his arm. Uh, he's got clumsiness. Uh, he's uh, got sort of a quieter voice now, and then this increased resistance to passive motion of the wrists. This is rigidity, and this is all consistent with Parkinson's. So notice that he's only 58 years old. Uh, he's got a decent life expectancy, so we want to uh, put him either on carbidopa levodopa, or we would put him on uh, something like, uh, like Rapinarol or Pramipexol. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can go for the USMLE. I would uh, stick with levodopa carbidopa because it's it's so well studied. Uh, so levodopa carbidopa, these this is just dopamine replacement. It's the most studied uh, regimen medication for Parkinson's. Selegiline, uh, this is an MAOB inhibitor. Uh, it increases, increases the amount of dopamine by inhibiting an enzyme MAOB, which metabolizes dopamine. Uh, coincidentally, with the MAOB inhibitors, uh, because it doesn't block MAOA, you don't run into the problems uh, with like uh, blocking the, uh, the metabolism of tyramine, so you're not as worried about cheese and wine and stuff like that. You also uh, don't block, because you're not blocking MAOA, you're not blocking the metabolism of norepinephrine and serotonin as much. Uh, so MAOB pretty much only metabolizes dopamine. So that's why it's really good to target it uh, in Parkinson's. Remember that Parkinson's is a degradation of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the substantia nigra, which is dopaminergic. Uh, and so these patients have a deficiency of dopamine, essentially. And so that's why we're replacing it. Memantine is an NMDA inhibitor, and this is primarily uh, used for Parkinson's-related dementia. It's also used for Alzheimer's. Uh, and then entacapone. Uh, entacapone is a uh, catechol o methyltransferase inhibitor, COMT inhibitor, uh, and this is good for, uh, for sort of late therapy in patients with Parkinson's. 
usually after you've been treating them with uh, levodopa, carbidopa for some time and you've tried other medications. This is something that you add on towards the end. So as I said, levodopa, carbidopa remains the cornerstone of management for Parkinson's disease. Dopamine agonists or MAOB inhibitors may be used as initial monotherapy, particularly in younger patients. And the reason for that is that levodopa, carbidopa, unfortunately, has one of the adverse effects is dyskinesia. It's really the opposite of what you would expect in Parkinson's. So in Parkinson's, you have bradykinesia. If you, when you're giving levodopa, carbidopa, these patients can have as a side effect hyperkinesis, so things like chorea and dystonia and athetosis. So the, uh, the dopamine agonists like pramipexol and rapinerol, uh, those are, uh, and the MAOB inhibitors, those are better as far as not having as much adverse effects of dyskinesia. So uh, particularly in younger patients where they have a longer lifespan, you may want to go to those instead of levodopa, carbidopa as a first medication. But for the USMLE, I would still stick with carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, if, uh, you can also add these too, and in addition to that, the COMT inhibitors, you can add these uh, if carbidopa, levodopa is insufficient. And then there's a new drug called pimavanserin, and this is also marketed as nuplazid, and this is a serotonin uh, inhibitor, and it actually works as an atypical antipsychotic. So patients with Parkinson's can get psychosis, uh, either related to their medication or uh, related to the uh, degenerative nature of their disorder. And up until recently, this drug was just approved in 2016, and it's really the only drug of its kind. Up until recently, we've given these patients Clozaril or Seroquel or Zyprexa, but what's the problem with atypical antipsychotics like those? They're dopamine antagonists, and they're going to worsen the patient's movement symptoms. So this particular drug, Nuplazid, is really good for, uh, for treating these patients' psychosis while not exacerbating their movement symptoms. So we already talked about dopamine replacement, uh, replacements. These anticholinergics, uh, as I said, they have the primary uh, limitation of uh, that you can't use them in patients with narrow, uh, closed-angle glaucoma. Uh, of course, the adverse effects of anticholinergics are going to be exactly what you'd expect, dry mouth, constipation, blurry vision, tachycardia. And then the treatment of Parkinson's-related dementia are very similar to how we treat Alzheimer's dementia, memantine, amantadine. Amantadine is also uh, has some dopaminergic activity, so it can also be used for treatment of the movement disorder. And then acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, denepazo, rivastigmine, galantamine, you run into this in Alzheimer's. Uh, these are actually cholinergic medications, and so they have the adverse effects of nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and GI bleed. All right. Um, I think that's all I wanted to go into with this. And then uh, also just keep in mind with any of the dopamine replacement medications, so uh, the uh, carbidopa, levodopa, dopamine agonists, MAOB inhibitors, uh, you can run into neuropsychiatric symptoms because you're basically feeding the patient dopamine or increasing their amount of circulating dopamine, and that, of course, puts you at risk of, of psychosis. Uh, it can also, particularly with the dopamine agonists like primipexil and rapinerol, uh, these patients can actually have really severe issues with impulse control disorders and increased libido, uh, audiovisual hallucinations, etc. So that is something that we uh, have to look out for. Okay, question four gives us a 48-year-old man presenting to the clinic with his wife because of ongoing joint pain for the past eight months. The pain is three out of ten and is symmetric, particularly affecting the wrists, fingers, and knees. It is the same in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Nothing has helped the pain, including acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and soaking in the hot tub. His wife notes that over the past couple years, his appearance has changed somewhat, and this came to her attention at a recent high school reunion where people hardly recognized him compared to five years earlier. When she looks at photos from a vacation several years ago on her phone, she says that she can't help but notice his appearance has changed. Vitals BP 148 over 97, heart rate 80, respirations 12, temperature 98.3. 
Physical examination is remarkable for a protruding jaw, sharp jawline, and spacing between his lower incisors, which he says he never had before. Past medical history is significant for carpal tunnel syndrome one year ago, which was successfully treated. Which of the following labs would most likely yield a diagnosis in this patient? A. IGF-1 levels, B. TSH levels, C. ACTH levels, D. Anti-SCL-70 antibodies, or E. Rheumatoid factor. All right, the answer to this one is A, IGF-1 levels. So what is the presumptive diagnosis in this patient? So this patient has acromegaly. So his chief complaint is joint pain. And joint pain has a long differential. So what do you want to know about the joint pain? First of all is when do you have the joint pain? If the joint pain is worse when you wake up then, and then gets better as the day goes on, you think of rheumatic issues, rheumatoid, arthro uh, rheum rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, etc., etc. Uh, however, this pain is uh, throughout the day. Uh, it's the same. Now, we would expect then uh, one of the potential diagnoses would maybe osteoarthritis, but he's pretty young. Plus, it's, it would be unusual for a guy who's otherwise healthy to develop osteoarthritis like this, especially at 48 years old. That's awfully young to develop osteoarthritis. And usually osteoarthritis will improve with NSAIDs, and this is not helping. Um, so uh, when you add to this then uh, that he's got a change in his appearance. Anytime you have a patient whose appearance has changed and changed abruptly over the course of years, your appearance changes over life, right? Nobody looks the same as they did 20 years ago. Uh, but when your appearance is changing abruptly over the course of years, and it's really dramatic changes, like changes in your facial structure, you need to think of acromegaly. So acromegaly is pretty rare, but it's something that you need to think of. And then put in, uh, in addition to this, his voice has changed. And, um, and, uh, and then in addition to that, he's got this, uh, actually, did I put his voice has changed? I don't know. Well, his voice should have changed. Um, okay, um, so that's another sign of acromegaly. Um, and, and then he's got a protruding jaw, the sharp jawline. This is just changes in his facial structure uh, and sp spacing between the lower incisors, which is, these are all very common signs of acromegaly. Uh, his past medical history being, being significant for carpal tunnel syndrome, very common in acromegaly. Um, and then uh, add on to that, uh, that he's got hypertension, which also happens with acromegaly because of changes in the heart structure. Uh, this is acromegaly until proven otherwise. And so our best initial test for acromegaly is to get IGF-1 levels. If those come back positive, you can get uh, post-glucose growth hormone levels. Uh, and then if that comes back positive, you're going to get an MRI. TSH, ACTH, this has nothing to do with thyroid. This has nothing to do with adrenals. Anti-SCL70 antibodies would be if we were suspecting scleroderma, and rheumatoid factor would be good if you were expecting rheumatoid arthritis. None of this fits with that. So acromegaly is an insidious endocrinologic condition uh, that results from excessive secretion of growth hormone after the epiphyseal growth plates are closed. Now if this happens in children and the epiphyseal growth plates are not closed yet, they're going to have linear growth of their bones. So they're going to get taller and taller and taller. It doesn't happen with acromegaly. Acromegaly, the bones may get wider, but they're not going to get longer. Uh, but with children, if the epiphyseal growth plates are not closed, their bones are just going to get longer and longer. They'll get really, really tall. And that's called gigantism. Acromegaly happens in adults. It's really the same pathologic process. It's just different because the epiphyseal growth plates are closed in adults. Uh, in addition to these characteristic uh, musculoskeletal symptoms that you see in acromegaly, you can also get hypertension, as we talked about, mitrovalvular regurgitation, uh, owing to the changes in the structure of the heart, diabetes, glucose resistance, or sorry, insulin resistance, uh, and then hyperpigmentation uh, or acanthosis nigricans. Women can also get menstrual abnormalities. So 95% uh, of cases are caused from a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma, and so 
MRI is going to be where you want to go once you've diagnosed acromegaly. Symptoms include joint pain, uh, and the joint pain is going to be present in about 70% of patients, and it's just due to thickening of the cartilaginous and periarticular fibrous tissue, uh, which causes joint swelling, pain, and uh, hypomobility, and ultimately it degrades the joint, leading to osteoarthritis and narrowing of the spaces. Um, they will have uh, enlargement of digits because of uh, change of the, the, the structure. They'll, be, they'll widen, and so they'll have less room in between their fingers. A lot of patients will note that their, rings, their ring doesn't fit them anymore, their wedding ring or what have you. Uh, changes to the facial features. As you can see in this patient, the chin has become much more prominent. Uh, the nose has become much larger, particularly at the base of the nose and you see uh, a more prominent uh, orbital rim here. And we'll look more at this in a little bit. Uh, you can get vocal deepening, and that's just due to changes to uh, the, the cartilaginous structures of the, uh, of the trachea and the uh, vocal cords. Uh, you get skin and soft tissue thickening, especially the hands, nose, and lips, as you can see here, the nose and the lips. And then the hands, the, the skin just gets thickened, and a lot of times they'll describe it as like a doughy feeling hand. Sometimes they might even describe it, and I hate this word, moist, a moist hand. And that's because uh, there's more uh, there's the more sweat glands. Uh, so the, the sweat glands enlarge, and so they sweat more, particularly on their palms and on their soles. Uh, that's a, a very early sign of acromegaly. Uh, they have prognathism, where the, the chin is, is protrudes, macroglossia, the tongue gets bigger. Uh, the, the mandible will, uh, because of its change in, in, uh, in structure, the teeth will get pulled apart, and so you'll have spacing of the teeth. I'll show you a picture of that, too. Uh, you can get visual field issues that can arise. If, if this is caused by a pituitary adenoma, you'll have a bitemporal hemianopsia. Uh, outside of these symptoms, you can get cardiovascular complications. This is typically a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, that's what's going to cause the mitral valve regurgitation, which ultimately can lead to a diastolic dysfunction. Uh, that cardiomyopathy can also stretch the conductive system of the heart and cause arrhythmias. Uh, because the ribs can change too, it can affect the geometry of the rib cage, and that can ultimately lead to sleep apnea. So that can be a problem as well. Ultimately, this is not a very common condition, only about five cases per million people per year. Uh, so not very common, uh, but the problem is that it, it, happen, it starts usually pretty early, usually when someone's in their 20s, and then, uh, but it doesn't typically get diagnosed for about 10 to 15 years. Median age of diagnosis is about 40. So uh, by the time it gets diagnosed, it's usually wreaked pretty bad havoc on the patient. All right, uh, so the diagnosis is serum IGF-1 level. Uh, if that comes back positive, you can get serum growth hormone level after one hour, uh, 100 milligram oral glucose administration. Uh, the, there's reference values for that. I didn't put them here because I don't want to load you up with useless information. You can look that up if you want. Uh, once that comes back positive, you'll obtain MRI once you've made the laboratory diagnosis. Uh, and that should uh, identify the mass. The treatment is surgical removal of the pituitary adenoma. That's first-line therapy in anybody with acromegaly who has a pituitary uh, adenoma. You do this transphenoidally. Uh, there's also radiation, but this is typically better. Uh, and then you'll, you'll get uh, follow-up growth hormone levels, IGF-1 levels, and, uh, and do another MRI to look for residual tissue. Uh, tumor tissue, and uh, if, if there is tissue, uh, which often there is, you can do growth hormone antagonist therapy uh, to correct the IGF-1 levels, and one of the medications for this is pegvizimand. Uh, you can also use octreotide as well. So this is an example of a gentleman here. Uh, before he started developing acromegaly, and then you can see dramatic changes to his face, particularly uh, the chin. If you got a more uh, better profile view, you'd be able to see that. You can see that the nose has gotten quite big, particularly here at the base of the nose. Uh, you can also see that the orbital rim has become much more prominent, um, and his lips are much bigger uh, 
now. I don't know what the, uh, the time lapse is here, but you can see quite dramatic changes to his face. This is that spacing between the teeth. These are the mandibular incisors. Uh, and uh, you can see here that there are changes. And you'd want to ask the patient, has it always been like this? Some patients just have this, uh, but you can see here that they're spacing. And you can also see a pretty large lip here. This is not the same patient. Obviously, if this were the same patient, the both hands would be like this. It would always be symmetrical. But you can see very large fingers. And what's another thing that causes large fingers like this in joint pain? Psoriatic arthritis. But these patients won't have a rash. Uh, so you can see that the, the, uh, the, the, the fingers are quite enlarged. Moving on to question five, we have a 61-year-old woman with stage four non-small cell lung cancer with bone metastasis, and she is undergoing palliative care. She complains of being more tired than usual, even though she's discontinued chemotherapy. CBC reveals hemoglobin of 9.2 grams per deciliter, MCV 90 femtoliters, white blood cell 3,200 per cubic millimeter, platelets 114,000 per microliter. Reticulocytes are 2%. Dacrocytes are noted on peripheral smear. Which of the following is the most likely explanation of this patient's anemia? A. Iron deficiency anemia. B. Anemia of chronic disease. C. Myelophysic anemia. D. Folate deficiency anemia due to chemotherapy. Or E. Myelodysplastic syndrome. All right. So this is a relatively straightforward short question, and the answer is C, myeloophthysic anemia. This is kind of uh, something that you don't see very often uh, if you don't work around cancer patients, and it's not something that comes up very commonly on the test, but it is one of those sort of 90th percentile questions that you know, if you know this stuff, you're, you're really uh, sitting pretty. So what do we have here? We've got a cancer patient who has got anemia. Not only does she have anemia, uh, she's more tired than usual. That should uh, encourage you to get a CBC. Not only does she have anemia, she's really actually got a pancytopenia. So she's got a low white count. What should her white count be? Should be between 4.5 to 11. Uh, thousand per cubic millimeter. So her white count is low and her platelets are low. What are platelets supposed to be? Platelets should be between 150 and, and 400 thousand. So she's got a pancytopenia and you'll be given all this you'll be given all this information on the test as far as normal values. Uh, so anytime you've got a patient with anemia you should immediately be going and looking at that MCV because you want to classify your different anemias. The MCV is below 80 it's a microcytic anemia. If it's between 80 and 100, it's a normocytic anemia. And if it's over 100, it's a macrocytic anemia. And then you should be able to make your differential diagnosis from there. So we have an MCV of 90. It's square in the normal range. And so this is a normocytic anemia. So we know it's probably not an iron deficiency because that would be below 80. And it's probably not a folate or B12 deficiency, which would be a macrocytic anemia. So right there, we can eliminate D. Now, folate deficiency, do we see that in chemotherapy patients? You bet we do. We see that in patients who are on methotrexate. Now, we try not to give methotrexate anymore because of that, but uh, we, we try to avoid it. Uh, we give methotrexate in a lot of immunologic, sort of autoimmune conditions, and then it is part of chemotherapy. Uh, but you, it is something you need to watch out for because it interferes with folate metabolism. But we can eliminate that uh, because the MCV is normal. Now, is it possible to have a normal MCV and have folate deficiency? Yeah, theoretically, if you have an iron deficiency and a folate deficiency, you can have small cells and big cells. And you put that together, your MCV, which really is an average, it's mean corpuscular volume, it's the average of the size of the red cells, it can fall in the, the normal, quote-unquote normal range, because you have very small cells and very big cells, uh, and it averages out. Uh, but that would be unusual. Uh, if you... It, it, if, if you do suspect that for whatever reason, you want to look at your red cell distribution width, RDW, and that's going to be high. What that tells you is sort of the, the range of, of sizes of, of the cells. Uh, so that's, that's something you may want to look at. But this is very unlikely uh, because her MCV is normal.
So this is not likely. Uh, now, why is iron deficiency anemia not very likely? Iron deficiency anemia is something you'd want to think of in a patient with a bleed or a patient who is, uh, is, is not getting very good uh, diet. Uh, but iron deficiency anemia is unlikely here because her reticulocytes are low. What should reticulocytes be? Reticulocytes should be 3% or higher at least, and it may even need to be higher than that depending on the hematocrit, and you would need to adjust your, your range for, for reticulocytes, your minimum uh, expected value for reticulocytes. Uh, but reticulocytes being low, we should suspect that it's not iron deficiency anemia because with pure iron deficiency anemia, the reticulocytes would be high. Why would they be high? Because reticulocytes is a measurement of your bone marrow response to anemia. If you have anemia and your reticulocytes are high, that tells you that your bone marrow is responding. If the reticulocytes are low, namely below 3%, 2%, uh, then that tells you your bone marrow is not responding, and that would not be a pure iron deficiency anemia. Anemia of chronic disease can be likely in chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, however, anemia of chronic disease tends to be a slightly lower MCV, usually low range of normal or even microcytic. Um, so that's not very likely here. And anemia of chronic disease will give you a normal morphology of your red blood cells. So what's the, what the giveaway here is these dacrocytes. And dacrocytes are tear-shaped red blood cells. So what's happening in myeloftisic anemia, what it is, is a disorder of the bone marrow, kind of like a fibrosis or a, uh, a, an infiltration of the bone marrow with cells that aren't supposed to be there. And what happens is these cells crowd out the bone marrow. And ultimately, it's going to disrupt the interface between the bone marrow and the blood. And what happens is when those red cells uh, get, get spilt out of the bone marrow, it, the, the membrane of the red blood cell gets distorted, and it causes this teardrop shape of the red blood cells, and I'll show you a picture of that. So myeloftisic anemia. Myeloftisic anemia is due to infiltration of abnormal cells, and that causes a subsequent destruction and replacement of the normal hematopoietic precursor cells. Most commonly, it's due to metastatic carcinoma. And what are the cancers that go to the bone? Most commonly, it's lung, breast, and prostate. And this patient had lung cancer. Other causes you may want to consider are lymphoproliferative malignancies like lymphomas, disseminated granulomatous diseases, that would be things like miliary TB, sarcoidosis, anything that can disseminate and cause granulomas. And then other things that you may want to consider are something like uh, Gaucher's disease, which is rare, but if you know they don't have any of the other things uh, and, and you're, you're at a loss, I guess it's something that you may want to consider. It's a it's a lipid metabolism disorder. I tell you to consider that, not so much for in real life because it's rare to diagnose that. I've never seen a patient with Gaucher's disease, but it's something to consider for the test because especially if you're taking step one, Gaucher's disease may come up. I don't know. I didn't get a question on it on my test, but uh, I'm just telling you for completion's sake. But far and away, the most common cause, metastatic cancer and lymphoma. Presentation is usually going to be anemia, and not only anemia, but anemia in an ill patient. Now, normally we think anemia in an ill patient, anemia of chronic disease, and that should be at the top of your differential. But when you have anemia in an ill patient, whether they have cancer, known cancer, or not, myeloftisic anemia should be on your differential, and this is why you want to get a smear. And when you get that smear, you're going to be looking for those for those uh, teardrop-shaped cells, those dacrocytes. Now, in addition with myeloftisic anemia, because this is affecting the bone marrow, the bone marrow is getting crowded out, the other lines of, of blood cells can be affected too, namely your platelets and your white blood cells. So you can have a pancytopenia. Uh, however, this can just present with regular old anemia and your platelets and white blood cell counts can be normal. So you don't have to have a pancytopenia. It may just affect your, your uh, red blood cells. Usually the red blood cells are the first to go though. Extramedullary hematopoiesis can be present. What's happening here is that you're not making enough red cells. These precursor cells will, will, will uh, take up residence in your spleen and liver, 
and you start making cells there, it's not going to be enough, so you're still going to have an anemia, uh, but what's going to happen is that because you've got extra medullary hematopoiesis in the spleen and in the liver, the spleen and the liver can become enlarged, and so these patients may have hepatomegaly and or splenomegaly. And then additionally, you will probably see symptoms of the underlying condition. A lot of times these patients will have already been diagnosed with cancer because typically this does not happen until like a stage four cancer, very progressed cancer. Uh, however, if they're not diagnosed with cancer, then you'll often see symptoms of the underlying condition, cachexia and stuff like that, bone pain. So when you do get your workup, you get a CBC, it'll show varying degrees of anemia, possibly a pancytopenia. MCV is going to be normal because this is not a problem with the red blood cells themselves. This is a problem with production of red blood cells. Uh, consequently, because this is a marrow disorder, the reticulocytes are going to be low. Remember, reticulocytes is a measurement of your marrow responding to anemia. Peripheral smear will reveal a leukoerythroblastic picture, and I'm going to show you what that means. A leukoerythroblastic picture gives you a, a constellation of abnormalities on your smear. So things, things like nucleated red blood cells, dacrocytes, circulating immature white blood cells, and giant platelets. They don't all have to be present, but you'll look for those things. And those things together give you what's called a leukoerythroblastic picture, and that's seen in myeloptic anemia. If you were to get a bone marrow tap, it may be dry. Why? Because the bone marrow is crowded out with abnormal cells. It can get fibrosed, and so if you do get a marrow tap, it might be dry. Not necessarily, but it might be. The treatment is to manage the underlying condition. There's really nothing we can do about this kind of anemia because the marrow is affected. So what can you do about it? All you can do is really transfuse the patient. And so normally we reserve transfusion uh, for hemoglobins that drop below 7 to 8. Uh, but really any patient who is gravely symptomatic, you'll want to transfuse them with red blood cells. So this is the leukoerythroblastic picture. Note that we have down here, we have a nucleated red blood cell. Uh, over here you can see a macrocyte. We don't see any giant platelets, but here's that famous dacrocyte, a teardrop-shaped red blood cell. Now normally you will see a, uh, a central pallor uh, in the red blood cell, but in some red blood cells notice that we do not. What's that called? So when you don't see that, that, uh, that uh, central pallor area, we call that polychromasia. Here it is, right here, polychromasia. Uh, so that's something that you can see in the, uh, in, in the myeloptic anemia, in this leukoerythroblastic picture. So I put this here. Uh, if you want to screenshot this or uh, uh, whatever, uh, you can do that. This, I think, is a nice chart that gives you some of the different uh, uh, morphologies of red blood cells, abnormal morphology. You see your target cell, uh, your spherocyte, helmet cell. Uh, all these different things that you can see on uh, on the test. Okay. All right. Question six: A 53-year-old woman presents to the clinic complaining of constipation. She says that over the past seven or eight months, she has only been having one or two bowel movements per week. When she does have a bowel movement, the stools are normal in appearance, albeit hard, and require some effort to expel. She denies abdominal pain or pain with bowel movements. She's otherwise been in good health. She's never had surgery. She's had colonoscopy two years ago, which was unremarkable. Weight is stable since her last visit a year ago. Physical examination is negative for abdominal pain and rectal masses, including hemorrhoids. Fecal occult blood test is negative. Laboratories, including BMP, magnesium, CBC, and TSH, are unremarkable. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A. Lactulose, B. Docusate, C. Cilium, D. Lubiprostone, or E. Colonoscopy. All right, this is a very common presentation that you will run into in the clinic. So you can bet USMLE is going to give you a question like this. You've probably encountered a patient like this at some point in your career, unlike the last one. All right, so this is 
our first step in management, and it is going to be cilium. So cilium is just Metamucil. And what does this patient have? So this patient has constipation. She's complaining of constipation, and that's indeed what she has. Most patients know what constipation is. However, patients will define constipation differently, as we're going to see. So let's look at the, uh, the subjective findings uh, here. So she's only got one or two bowel movements per week. How many bowel movements should you have per week? You should probably have at least three bowel movements per week. And that's going to vary from person to person. Some people, my sister just told me her boyfriend has four bowel movements a day. And, and that seems kind of weird to me, a little abnormal. Uh, but, you know, it just really depends on a lot of things from person to person, your diet, how much you're moving around, etc. Um, but you should have at least three bowel movements per week. Uh, when she does have a bowel movement, the stools are normal in appearance, so that's good. We, what, what, what do we want to ask about in any patient who's complaining about diarrhea, constipation, pain, and defecation? We want to ask, how, do the, how, do the, how does the poop look? And is it black? Is it red? Uh, we want to know about bleeding. Uh, so she says it's normal in appearance. Ask about the color. Ask about the texture. Okay? Is it hard? Is it, is it uh, soft? Are there creases on it? You can give a patient what's called the Bristol stool scale and what it's got is these pictures of, of stool, these illustrations, and you can have them point to which one their stool looks like. Uh, and usually it should be kind of in the middle where it's not lumpy and cracky, uh, but at the same time it's not liquidy. Uh, so she says that they're they're normal in appearance. So the only thing that's abnormal about her stool is that they're it's a little bit hard and it's difficult to get out. That's pretty classic constipation. Importantly, here she says that there's no abdominal pain and no pain with bowel movements. Abdominal pain uh, would would suggest uh, if if she's having ongoing abdominal pain, especially if it's relieved with defecation, that would suggest irritable bowel syndrome. And if that were the case, we would go about management a little bit differently. Fiber would certainly be important, uh, but we would go about it a little bit differently. If there was pain with bowel move movements, we'd want to think about the possibility of hemorrhoids, uh, but we don't see that on physical examination. She's never had surgery. So surgery would be more of a risk factor for an obstruction uh, if there were adhesions. Uh, but we're not worried about that here because she is able to have a bowel movement. It's just difficult. And then uh, this is extremely important. So I'm going to skip down here. Fecal occult blood test. Any patient, any patient who comes to you complaining of constipation, get a fecal occult blood test. This is so easy. You have these little these little uh, cards in in the clinic, and all you do is you get a little bit of stool when you do a rectal exam, which you should be doing anyway because you're looking for hemorrhoids, you're looking for anal fissure, and you get a little bit of stool uh, on uh, your your glove finger, and you put that onto this card, and it'll turn a color, usually blue, uh, if it's positive. If, if it's positive, then this patient is bleeding. And if they're bleeding, you need to send this patient off to a GI doctor pronto because they're going to get a colonoscopy. If it's normal, then you can be rest assured that this patient doesn't have any bleeding. So this is something that is so easy to do, and it will, will screen out the patients that may have something really serious going on, like colon cancer or, or possibly uh, a diverticulosis uh, that may be infected. Uh, so please, 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 please get your occult blood test. It is so easy to get. It's something that's very often neglected. Now, your laboratories, your workup for constipation, you need to get labs. And those labs, as we're going to see with our differential for constipation, for secondary constipation, include things like metabolic issues, so abnormal electrolytes, uh, high magnesium levels. Uh, you want to get a CBC because we're looking for anemia. If, if you have a patient with anemia, what kind of anemia do you think it would be? It would be an iron deficiency anemia if the patient's bleeding. But hopefully we caught that with the occult blood test. Something very easy to get. But you can get a CBC uh, as well. And then, of course, you want to get a thyroid stimulating hormone. And you may or may not get you know, thyroid hormone levels with that too, T3, T4. Uh, but you want to get a TSH. And that's because one of the more common causes of constipation is hypothyroidism. 
So all of that uh, considered, we've done all this and everything checked out normal. This is a patient with just regular old normal transit primary constipation, the more common uh, reason that somebody would have constipation. She's probably not getting enough fiber in her diet. She's probably not moving around enough. So that's the cause of her constipation. Well, of course, we would want to ask, and I didn't put it on here, are you on any medications? If she's on uh, antacids, if she's on, certainly if she's on uh, pain medication, opioids, then that could be the cause. But in any case, we're going to be treating her with fiber. And psyllium is just uh, fiber that you take, like Metamucil. Now, lactulose uh, would, would not be indicated in this patient. Docusate would not be indicated in this patient. These are laxatives, and we don't want to give those yet. We may need to give them if she doesn't respond to fiber alone. Lubiprostone is, uh, is something that helps with constipation, but it's reserved for patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And this patient does not have irritable bowel syndrome. She doesn't have abdominal pain uh, before her bowel movements, so that's unlikely. I'll, I'll show you the Rome criteria for IBS in a little bit. And then colonoscopy would be indicated if she had one of those red flag symptoms, which I'll go over in the next couple slides. So constipation is having fewer than three bowel movements per week. Some of the risk factors include female sex, older age, inactivity. If you're not moving around, those abdominal muscles aren't going to be uh, helping you to move uh, things along your, your intestine. Lower caloric intake. Interesting. I had a patient uh, a couple years ago a young guy, probably 25, 26 years old, came in saying, I'm only pooping once a week. What's going on? As it turns out, this guy was a bodybuilder trying to lose some weight, trying to build muscle. He's only eating protein shakes. Well, if you're only eating protein shakes, you're not getting hardly any fiber. You're not, you're, you're really absorbing all the nutrients uh, that, that you're eating. I mean, everything that you're eating is being absorbed as nutrients. It's just protein and water. Is all he's eating. So of course you're not going to make that much stool because you know, normally a certain percentage of the, the food we eat is roughage and it comes out in the stool. But if you're absorbing everything that you're eating, uh, then you're not going to have a lot of stool at all. So I told him, well, you know, it's probably okay that you're only having that many bowel movements, but you should probably have some fruits and vegetables and, and get some fiber in your diet. Uh, not only because you need to be pooping more, uh, but because you need to get vitamins, and, and it's just healthy for your intestines in general. So, uh, low fiber diet. 90% of Americans are ha have a low fiber uh, diet. They're not getting their daily recommended amount of fiber, which is usually between 20 and 25 grams. Uh, so this is the reason why we have a higher incidence of colon cancer in this country. It's the reason we, why we have a higher degree of diverticulosis in this country. And I would say it's probably the reason, one of the reasons that we're overweight in this country. Because if, uh, when you consume fiber, it makes you feel fuller longer. If you're not consuming fiber, you're going to not feel as full for as long a time and you're going to be eating more. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of supplemental fiber for everybody. Uh, unless, you know, they're vegetarian or they really make the effort to eat, get their fruits and vegetables. Uh, lower income, don't know why. Lower educational level, don't know why. Taking a large number of medications, there's a lot of medications that can cause constipation. We'll go over a few of them, uh, but uh, some of these include uh, iron supplementation, opioids is a big one, uh, antipsychotics, anticholinergics, antihistamines, calcium channel blockers, and sympathomimetics, so if they're on like Ritalin or, or something like that. Uh, so the ones you really need to remember for the test are antacids, iron supplementation, and opioids. Those are the big three you need to remember. As I said, the symptoms of constipation vary because patients will describe constipation differently. Some people think constipation is just they have hard stools or they have to strain. Other patients are aware that the definition of constipation is really how many stools you're having. Uh, but in any case, we're concerned about either of those. If, it, if it's very difficult or even painful for you to get your stools out, we're concerned about that. If you're not having enough bowel movements per week, if you're only uh, having two bowel movements a week, we're concerned about that. So in any case, we're going to take these patients seriously. We divide constipation up into primary and secondary constipation. Primary constipation is also known as functional constipation. 
So primary constipation gets divided up into normal transit, slow transit, and outlet constipation. Normal transit constipation is usually just diagnosed clinically. It's really the diagnosis of exclusion. So normal transit uh, constipation is associated with some abdominal pain, mild abdominal pain, and bloating. Usually this is the one that responds to uh, fiber and laxatives. This is really a diagnosis of exclusion. This is our patient that we had in our vignette. Slow transit constipation is an issue with the intestines where it's just not moving things along properly. It's just moving too slowly. Uh, and what happens with this is that the slower things move along, the more water absorption you're going to have. So if you have more water absorption, uh, you're going to have harder stools and it's going to be harder to get them out. These patients will, uh, will uh, probably not respond very well to fiber. They may respond better to laxatives. Uh, there is a way that you can diagnose this objectively, and you get a, an abdominal x-ray with radio-opaque markers, and then you take it on, uh, after five days. And if you still see the radio-opaque markers, what it tells you is that the, the intestine is just taking too long. And then there's outlet constipation. This is an issue of the pelvic floor muscles that are responsible for helping you defecate. Uh, and, and what's happening then is that the stool is not expelling when it, it reaches the rectum. The classic outlet constipation is going to be a patient who needs to uh, manually manipulate their, their anus or rectum to get the stool out. They're going to strain to get the stool out, but then when it does come out, it's not hard, which we would expect for you to strain to get the stool out. The stool is actually going to be soft. It's going to be normal stool, but they're straining, and that's because this is a pelvic musculature issue. So those are your three different kinds of primary constipation. They're not related to any medical condition or any medications. Secondary constipation is related to medications or medical conditions. So medical conditions, the more common one you'll run into is hypothyroidism. It can also be related to diabetes, which is probably because of autonomic neuropathy. And then there's multiple sclerosis and uh, Parkinson's disease, some neurologic conditions. Uh, immobility, which I guess isn't really a medical condition, but certain medical conditions can cause you to be immobile. And then a couple of really important ones I didn't put here, anal fissures and hemorrhoids. That's just because it makes it painful to defecate, so these patients won't defecate as often. And what can happen is fluid can get absorbed, and, and it's going to cause those stools to become harder and more lumpy, and that can make it difficult too. So these patients will really benefit from some fiber supplementation, and that's one of the things that we do for patients who have hemorrhoids. Uh, you can run into a vicious cycle here. So a patient who has hemorrhoids usually gets it from straining, and if their stools are getting harder, they're going to have to strain more, and that's going to make the hemorrhoids worse. And so fiber is very good for hemorrhoids. Uh, and then for medications. So constipation causing medications are opioids, calcium-containing antacids, and iron supplementation. Those are the big ones you need to remember for the test. And you need to exclude irritable bowel syndrome anytime you have a patient with constipation because that will be managed a little bit differently. Although fiber supplementation is really also the cornerstone of, of, of lifestyle management for patients with IBS as well. So the Rome criteria for irritable bowel syndrome is this. It's symptoms that have an onset of more than six months, so it's got to be chronic. And then, importantly, you have abdominal pain or discomfort for more than three days per month over the last three months with more than two of the following. The pain improves with defecation. There's an onset with a change in stool frequency, or there's an onset with a change in stool form. Got to have two or more of these. And this is the criteria for IBS. The Rome 3 criteria came, back, came out back in, in 2006 or so. So if there are any red flag symptoms, this is very important. You need to refer the patient to gastroenterology for colonoscopy. Usually this is going to be in older patients, but everybody, you need to look for these red flag symptoms. And these are very important that you just memorize these. So hematochesia, they're bleeding. That you're going to pick that up either on history, uh, but certainly you're going to be doing that uh, OCA blood test. Uh, if that's positive, they're going to a gastroenterologist for colonoscopy. You're not going to even uh, you, you, you're, you're not even going to hang on to these patients. They need to go off for a referral. Unintended weight loss, obviously, sign of cancer. They need to go off for a referral. Family history of colon cancer, 
Um, you know, you can use your 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 judgment here. If it's uh, a patient that just came out of a colonoscopy a year ago, you probably don't need to send them off for colonoscopy. Uh, but it's something that you really need to consider if the patient hasn't had a colonoscopy recently. Iron deficiency anemia that shows that they're bleeding. You're just not recognizing it. Positive fecal occult blood test. Already talked about that. Off to off to gastroenterology and an acute onset in an older patient. So all these patients send them off to a GI, they're gonna get a colonoscopy. Otherwise, the initial management for constipation is fiber supplementation, take some Metamucil uh, per the, uh, the, the box, it'll tell you how to use it. Uh, usually it's just some orange stuff, you mix it in some water, you gotta drink it right away, otherwise it gunks up and it doesn't work. Uh, and, and so that's uh, your fiber supplementation. Fluids, why fluids? Because if you're dehydrated, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna have harder stools. Uh, so make sure that you're drinking, you know, uh, eight, I think it's uh, eight servings of uh, eight ounce glasses of water per day. And then uh, exercise. So why exercise? Because that just helps with your abdominal muscles, it starts moving things around. Another thing I tell patients is, you know, if you like to drink coffee, drink coffee. Uh, for some reason, coffee has a little bit of a laxative effect. Uh, so that can be really useful for them too, uh, I've found uh, with patients. So having, you know, maybe an extra morning cup of coffee, even if it's decaf, um, may help with uh, getting to the bathroom. Laxatives like docusate should only be attempted after a trial of fiber supplementation. These, what they do is they stimulate the intestine, they, they, they move things faster, and that's good, but the problem is it can also dehydrate you because you're you're pooping out more water. So um, I and and plus these patients that it's it's very uncomfortable and it's uh, usually they have a, a a harder time. You know, there's more urgency to go to the bathroom, and it can be more of a problem for these patients. They usually don't like it. Uh, so that really should only be attempted after a trial of fiber supplementation, but it is something you can go to. But this is the initial management, fiber supplementation, uh, fluids, and exercise. Okay, question seven gives us a 21-year-old man presenting to the clinic complaining of severe aching left leg pain over the past two days, which has made it quote-unquote impossible to walk. He rates the pain as a 9 out of 10 when walking, and it's localized to the left anterior leg. The pain improves when he's not putting force on his leg. He's tried ibuprofen and hot and cold compresses to no avail. He notes that he's not a runner, but did join a running group this past week and ran 5 miles and felt fine the entire time despite a little bit of pain in his ankles and legs. He's 6 feet 1 inches tall and 180 pounds, corresponding to a BMI of 23.8. Strength of the left lower extremity is limited by pain. Range of motion and sensation are normal. There's no apparent trauma or deformity of either leg, but there's some bony point tenderness on palpation of the left anterior tibia and some mild surrounding edema. Home and sinus negative, past medical history is unremark unremarkable. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this patient's complaints? A, tibial stress fracture, B, Achilles tendonitis, C, deep vein thrombosis, D, compartment syndrome, or E, medial tibial stress syndrome, also known as shin splints. Okay, so our answer to this one is A. He's got a stress fracture, and that is obviously of the tibia, because that's where he's saying the pain is. So you've got a guy coming in, anyone coming in complaining of pain, your differential diagnosis is always huge, and that includes leg pain. It doesn't really get a whole lot smaller. Uh, so leg pain is a big differential. Now, just looking at the first few sentences here, uh, the first third of this question, if this were a 60-year-old guy coming in saying he's got leg pain, left leg pain, just in one leg, and it's uh, very difficult to walk. It's worse when he walks, and when when he walks, and and it goes away when he sits down. What's the thing that the first thing that should come to your mind that's really a big problem that we need to worry about? You should be worried about claudication. Uh, but this guy's 21, so we're not worried about that. Now, 
when you got somebody coming in with pain, you want to get a good history. Anytime you got a big differential, you want a good history. Uh, but pain requires a very particular history. That you remember your PQRST. So you want to know where is the pain? How is the pain? How would you describe the pain? How would you rate the pain? Uh, where uh, does the pain, if you do have in one particular area, does it radiate or is it very specifically in one area? And what makes the pain better? What makes the pain worse? So you have all that information. That will help you narrow your differential down or at least kind of help you uh, create a, a list where you know, you've got one thing that's more likely than the other. Uh, so uh, we know that the pain is really severe. That doesn't tell us a whole lot because some people have a lower pain tolerance than others. Uh, but we know that the pain, this is important, this is useful to us. The pain is bad when he walks, but it gets better when he sits down. Uh, so that suggests something musculoskeletal. Uh, he uh, has tried ibuprofen and hot and cold compresses, which haven't helped. Uh, he's not, this is important, so he's not a runner, but he joined a running group this past week. Uh, this tells you that this is probably an overuse injury. And there's a lot of different injuries that can be categorized as overuse. Uh, but anytime you have somebody that's putting extra stress on an area, and now they're getting pain, that suggests an overuse injury, like a sports injury, and that's in fact the case here. Now, some important things going on here. When you do your physical exam, he's got bony tenderness, and it's very, very focal, very localized. It's point tenderness. Now, what I like to do when I get a history of a patient, when they're coming in complaining of pain, is I ask them where the pain is, and then I look to see how they're pointing to the pain. If they're pointing to it with their finger, this is very localized pain. And this suggests some different things, regardless of whether this is belly pain, if it's leg pain, if it's neck pain, what have you. If they're pointing with their finger, it's very focal. It's very localized. If they're pointing with their hand, or especially if they're pointing with their hand and they're moving their hand around, that tells you that it's more generalized pain. And that's going to be sort of a differential diagnosis than if it's focal pain. Now, the tenderness is on the left anterior tibia. And that's going to be really important for your differential, as we're going to see. So why not B? Why not Achilles tendonitis? So Achilles tendonitis is an overuse injury. You see it in, in athletes. You see it in people who start running. And that could certainly be something that he could get from doing what he's doing. But Achilles tendonitis, where's that pain going to be? It's going to be in the heel. It's going to be calcaneus area. That's not where his pain is. So we can pretty much rule that out at this point. Deep vein thrombosis. Why not that? So is deep vein thrombosis something you expect to see in an athlete, a young, healthy person who's running around and is active? No. Deep vein thrombosis is something that you get from prolonged immobilization. Or maybe they're not prolonged immobilized, but they're a 26-year-old woman who smokes and just started taking oral contraceptives. Or maybe it's a 29-year-old woman who's pregnant. Or maybe a 45-year-old guy who's got cancer. All of those things can cause deep vein thrombosis, but not in a healthy 21-year-old guy who started running and now has pain. Uh, so deep vein thrombosis would also probably give you a positive Homan sign, but that's not always the best test. But if the USMLE tells you Homan sign is negative, you can rule out deep vein thrombosis. Not in real life, though, so much. Compartment syndrome also can be from injury. But usually compartment syndrome will, will be associated with some kind of discrete or more severe injury. So like you get into a car accident and your leg gets crushed and you got a severe fracture uh, of, of your leg. That can lead to compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome can also happen from IV drug use. It can happen from, uh, from, from uh, reperfusion injury. Uh, but none of that is really consistent with this patient. Now if he had a severe fracture and now, you know, we... Two weeks later, he's got uh, pain in his leg, new onset pain, uh, then, then that could be compartment syndrome. Another thing that sort of shies you away from, from compartment syndrome is that compartment syndrome will usually cause some degree of, of neurologic issues, so some, uh, some numbness. And the reason, if you remember back to what compartment syndrome is, is it's increased pressure in a myofascial compartment. So, uh, you know, the, the left leg can be a, is a compartment. Uh, but what happens is that that pressure builds up and it compresses the vasculature, it compresses the nerve. And so that's what leads to the pain, but it's also what leads to sort of that numbness and tingling uh, 
uh, that you can get with compartment syndrome. So that's not the case here. Now, here is another thing that if you narrowed it down to A, B, and E, you are on the right track. If you narrowed it down to A and E, you're really on the right track. Shin splints is something that this guy's history looks a lot like shin splints. So shin splints is also an overuse injury. It also happens with exercise, people that are, are newly exercising. Uh, so the, the first half of his history looks a lot like shin splints. This guy could have shin splints. What shies you away from shin splints, what really sets your differential here, is where the pain is at and that it's very focal. So shin splints occurs in the medial tibial area, just like its name implies. You should remember medial tibial stress syndrome instead of shin splints because this tells you where the pain is at. So this guy's pain is on his anterior tibia. But what's more important, because you can get a stress fracture affecting the medial tibia, what's more important is that with shin splints, you need to know that with shin splints, it affects a longer area. Usually the pain, where they point to the pain, where you can elicit the tenderness, is over an area of about five or six inches. It affects sort of the whole lower two thirds of the tibia uh, over you know five, six, seven inches. Whereas with stress fractures, it's generally just in one very localized area. Like I said, they can point to it with their finger. So that's how you're going to differentiate this from shin splints. Stress fractures are basically a fracture that results from abnormal stress on normal bone. So this guy has abnormal stress because he's never really been running and now he's running a lot. You can also get stress fractures from normal stresses on abnormal bone, so like osteoporosis for instance. The difference between these two is what's called a fatigue stress fracture and an insufficiency stress fracture. So the fatigue stress fracture is what this guy's got. Excessive stress on normal bone. Uh, whereas an insufficiency fracture would be normal stress on abnormal bone. Very similar to that pathologic fracture. Stress fractures account for about 10% of injuries seen in sports medicine clinics. Very, very common. You particularly see this in new athletes. Maybe uh, you've taken the summer off and now you're going back to school and you're doing track and field and uh, you've been doing a lot of running where you haven't all summer. You can get a stress fracture military recruits. So you sign up for the military, you go to boot camp, and they they got you running three, four miles every morning. Definitely a, a situation where you'll, you know, you're at risk for a stress fracture. Other risks, women tend to get them more often than men for some reason, possibly a bone density thing. Uh, alcohol and smoking have negative effects on the bone mineral density. Obviously, as you can imagine, vitamin D a deficiency, calcium deficiency can, can cause it as well. We tend to see stress fractures in runners uh, more than other things, but ballet dancers can get it, uh, really any sport, but running is the most common way that you get stress fractures. Where do they happen? Far and away, the tibia and the, uh, the, the upper foot, uh, the, the, the tarsals, are going to be the more common areas you get it. That accounts for almost half of stress fractures. So the, the tibia and the tarsals, particularly the navicular bone. The metatarsals are another very common area and then the fibula is, believe it or not, a, a pretty common area. Other areas you can get it of the hip, you can get it of the femur, but this is pretty much lower extremity. You don't get stress fractures in, in your ribs or in your arms. You get them in the lower extremity. The diagnosis for, uh, for stress fracture is clinical you pretty much will never have to do an x-ray but uh, to diagnose stress fracture, but you may get an x-ray to uh, because it's a fracture that often occurs with just really minor uh, activity that's that's not uh, part of your uh, well it's 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 injury that's not associated with a discrete event. We'll put it that way. You probably want to get an x-ray to rule out. Things like, especially since this happens in younger people, you want to rule out like bone malignancies, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma. Uh, just for good clinical practice, you probably just want to get an x-ray. When it's a new stress fracture, you're not going to see anything. You will see, there are some, some findings that you might see if this stress fracture is two weeks old, uh, but those patients are not going to come in. It's, they're going to come in a lot sooner than that if they do come in. So a plain radiograph is not really going to tell you a whole lot. You might uh, get a bone scan or MRI, but 
really in real life that's kind of overkill but on the USMLE they may give you that uh, those are s certainly much more sensitive than than radiographs uh, but uh, in, in practice you're really not going to be getting that so the the way stress fracture happens and I'll just try to boil this down for you so you have a good idea uh, so what happens is when you're exercising, and this goes for both muscle and bone, when you're exercising, when you're lifting weights, when you're running, when you do any kind of exercise, what happens is you get little tiny, tiny micro traumas, we'll call them. And that happens in your bone, it happens in your muscle. And that's good. That's good. That should happen because when it happens in your bone, it activates the osteoblasts and osteoclasts to sort of break down bone and then uh, remodel the bone so it's consistent with what the bone needs to do and over time the bone strengthens likewise in the muscle when you're lifting weights you get little tiny tears in the muscle and that stimulates the muscle to grow and that's why your muscles grow when you lift weights over a period of time now contrast that to running five miles when you've really never had a running regimen before and now you're running five miles a day or you go to the gym and you start lifting weights, maybe you overdo it, and you get a muscle tear. A muscle tear uh, is, is sort of similar in, in, in uh, pathophysiology mechanism. Uh, it's analogous to a stress fracture. It's, it's too much of a good thing. It's too much microtrauma. And so because you have too much microtrauma, you actually have trauma. And, and so what's happening is that you develop an actual fracture. Whereas if you were going about your exercise healthfully, you would actually just have little micro traumas which would allow your, your bone to remold itself. Similar to your muscle, you have little micro tears, uh, but if you, if you go at it too zealously, then you're going to have actual tears. So that's the difference. It's really too much of a good thing. The management of a stress fracture is just conservative. There's really nothing we can do for this guy. Uh, you just rest the bone, acetaminophen for pain. It's good to stress to him that you should have good proper footwear. That will reduce your risk, maybe not for tibial stress fractures, but definitely for uh, these, these uh, fractures in the foot. And then, very importantly for this guy, pacing of intensity. You know, really just take it easy and, and, and go slowly. Very similar to if you're lifting weights. Go slowly. Don't go and lift 100 pounds. Ben try to bench press 100 pounds if you've never done it before. Start slowly and work your way up. That's the way that you're going to improve your, your, your ability to exert yourself. Uh, this is just an aside here. I found this in AFP article. Tibial stress fractures may be additionally treated with pneumatic compression devices to hasten recovery. I don't know a whole lot about that, but if you want to look that up, that's there. All right, so moving on to a new case here. We have a 19-year-old woman who's brought to the ED following a motor vehicle accident where she was an unrestrained passenger. She was found to have multiple lacerations on her thighs. The bleeding was noticed to be severe and is being controlled with direct pressure. Physical examination is remarkable for lacerations, but no head or neck trauma. No tenderness to palpation of the vertebrae. Glasgow coma scale is E4B5M6, corresponding to 15, which is good. Uh, you should know your Glasgow coma scale, though. Uh, vitals, blood pressure 95 over 70, heart rate 115, respirations 14, temperature 97.7, IV fluids are started, and the decision to transfuse two units of O negative blood is made. 20 minutes after beginning transfusion, nursing notifies you that the patient has developed hives. This complication of blood transfusion is most likely associated with which of the following syndromes? A. DeGeorge syndrome, B. Adenosine deaminase deficiency, C. Hereditary angioedema, D. Selective IgA deficiency, or E. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. All right, so this is pretty straightforward, but you gotta know this particular syndrome in order to get this. If you don't, you're gonna have no clue. So our answer here is selective IgA deficiency. So selective IgA deficiency is the only, all this stuff I gave you is totally irrelevant, uh, except for the fact that you gave the patient blood and now they've got hives. 
Um, so there's one thing that might have fooled you here. Uh, but uh, you gave the patient blood and they got hives. So the only thing out of all five of these that's going to do that is selective IgA deficiency. So that's really the only thing I am testing you on here, is your, your knowledge of uh, selective IgA deficiency. It's the only thing that's going to do that. None of these other things even come close, except for maybe hereditary angioedema, but it's still not going to do this. So let's look back at this. DeGeorge syndrome, what is that? That's a congenital condition. It's thymic hypoplasia. The only thing that the George syndrome shares in common with selective IgA deficiency is that they both are immunodeficiencies. The George syndrome is a little bit more severe. Uh, it gives you, uh, when you do have the immunodeficiency, it gives you an AIDS-like picture. These patients are at risk for pneumocystis, fungal infections, uh, some severe viral infections. Um, they can get a graft versus host uh, disease-like picture with, with blood transfusions, but they're not going to get hives. So I guess that kind of comes close, too. Um, adenosine deaminase deficiency is also uh, a, 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 an issue with uh, your, your immune system to some degree. It's a metabolic issue. It, it causes the cells, particularly the lymphocytes, to not be able to develop properly. And so you can get an immune deficiency from that, but you're not going to have any problem with blood transfusion. I'm going to skip hereditary angioedema. I want to come back to that. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, also an immunodeficiency. So you can see none of these relate to IgA deficiency except for that they're immunodeficiencies. Uh, but with Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, you're not going to have issues with blood transfusion. What you do see with Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, and you should remember for the USMLE, is it's a triad. And that triad is thrombocytopenia, eczema, and immunodeficiency. These patients uh, have issues with ear and sinus tract infections. Uh, they do have a slightly deficient IgM, so they're going to have uh, more of the B cell related immunodeficiency signs, more respiratory tract issues, as opposed to the T cell uh, signs, which are more the AIDS like picture, where they get pneumocystis and fungal infections and stuff like that. So, hereditary angioedema. Hereditary angioedema, remember what that is. That's that C1 inhibitor deficiency, where when they come into uh, issues with like Trauma, so like this patient, got into a car accident, had lacerations, possibly some bony injuries, but we don't know. They, what happens is that there's this trauma and their complement system gets activated. And normally, when our complement system gets activated, when it's not supposed to get activated, what we have is a C1 inhibitor. And the C1 inhibitor keeps the complement system intact. Patients with hereditary angioedema lack that C1 inhibitor. They have deficient amount of C1 inhibitor. And so when they come into contact with, with stress or with trauma, their, uh, their uh, complement system just goes bananas. And so they'll uh, remember what happens when you have complement uh, activating your, when you have your complement system activated, uh, you get just very porous vessels. And so you get edema. You get edema everywhere. Uh, you get edema in your lips, in your face, in your airway, in your GI tracts. So you can get diarrhea. Uh, but they're not going to get hives. So it's similar in that it activates a, an immune response, but the similarities end there. And, and so you're not going to get hives. This is not a, 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 an allergic reaction. This is just a, a reaction of your complement system. And so it causes that, that sort of swelling. That I mean, You can get edema. Uh, with, with immune response, but you're not going to get hives with hereditary angioedema. So this is a complement issue, and you should know the difference there. It's pretty fundamental. Uh, but you should know hereditary angioedema. You should know all of these for the USMLE. They're all pretty important. So selective IgA deficiency is actually what this is here. It's also known as hereditary IgA deficiency, but hereditary IgA deficiency is not a good name for it because we don't really know the how hereditary it is and there's probably a lot of cases where it's not hereditary where it's sporadic and we don't really know what kind of uh, Mendelian pattern it follows if it even follows one at all in many cases it's been described as autosomal dominant but that's probably only because we know it, in, in cases where we know it's hereditary we the only person we know has it as a parent and so we assume then it must be autosomal dominant 
but there's all sorts of patterns have been described. So for that reason, we call it selective IgA deficiency because we don't know to what degree it's even hereditary at all. And so what it is is it's a deficiency of IgA, and that's due to the B cells not being able to develop into IgA-secreting plasma cells. It's pretty common, about 1 in 300, um, so that's you know, not a negligible amount. And uh, remember that IgA, it's the most abundant antibody that's produced in the body, and it does play a role in addition to uh, playing a role in, in the immune response. It also is very prevalent in the intestines and helps mediate uh, a normal intestinal flora. And so that's the reason it, it, it has some of these manifestations that we don't see in other uh, antibody deficiencies. So it's relatively non-severe as far as the other antibody deficiencies go, uh, and it really just results in a mild increased susceptibility to uh, the respiratory tract infections, uh, UTIs, and uh, otitis media, pneumonia, um, increased risk of giardiasis, pretty much the same picture you see in all the other antibody deficiencies, but it's less severe than those. And so because it's so much less severe, as a matter of fact, 85 to 90 percent of patients with IgA deficiency are never diagnosed. The more common reason they're diagnosed is exactly the reason we saw in our vignette. So it's not at all surprising that this patient didn't have any medical history uh, until now, until she had this anaphylaxis to blood transfusion. I will just add here, because it might come up on the test, that with selective IgA deficiency, they do have an increased risk of allergic and autoimmune uh, disorders, so celiac disease in particular, because that IgA is so prevalent in the intestinal tract. Uh, they're at risk of ulcerative colitis, probably along the lines for the same reason, but I'm not sure. Uh, atopic dermatitis, Hashimoto's, lupus. Uh, so they are at risk for allergic and autoimmune issues, and then also certain malignancies, and that is along the same lines as why uh, they have uh, those patients with, uh, with combined variable immunodeficiency, uh, the other antibody deficiencies, they also have risk for those malignancies too. So those are going to be like lymphoid malignancies like non-Hodgkin's, Hodgkin's, uh, GI malignancies like gastric uh, uh, I think it's gastric adenocarcinoma, I'm pretty sure. I don't think it's the lymphoma down there. Uh, and then colorectal cancer. I don't know if that relates to the immune system itself or if it relates to the intestinal issues that they've got, um, uh, but those are there as well. So that's not important in this patient, obviously, uh, but that is important for the test. So what came up in this patient was the most serious implication of IgA deficiency, and that's anaphylaxis with blood transfusion. In a lot of, uh, of, of blood uh, transfusions, uh, unless they're specifically washed, uh, they have a lot of IgA in them. And their body does not recognize IgA because they don't make enough IgA. So what results in that is that they get an, a, an allergic response. It's really just a, a delayed hypersensitivity, uh, or, or uh, sorry, just a hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, they can also get anaphylaxis with IVIG therapy. So some of the some of the antibody deficiencies uh, you would treat with IVIG, not IgA deficiency, because they would get an anaphylaxis, so you can't do that. Uh, really, the only way to cure this, but we really don't have to because it's so mild, the only way to cure this would be bone marrow transplantation. So the treatment for selective IgA deficiency is really just trying to prevent uh, the, the, uh, the infections, and then most importantly, uh, if you ever need, if they have selective IgA defici deficiency and you know it, make sure that you use IgA washed blood products and what, unless you want your, your patient to, uh, to start getting hives and possibly a life-threatening allergic reaction, which you don't want. Uh, so that's uh, your treatment. So this is selective IgA deficiency. So we will conclude here with a pair of questions. A 50-year-old man presents to the ER with his girlfriend because of fever and worsening shortness of breath for the past week. While he's been febrile, he's also had a productive cough, which she characterized the sputum as blood, quote-unquote, and also he has some pain and inspiration. His girlfriend says that he drinks about 375 milliliters of vodka every day, which is about 10 standard drinks. 
patients are rarely going to tell you how, how many milliliters. So they usually tell you the size of the bottle. But here you have it. USMLE may give you that. And sometimes he drinks more until he passes out. He also smokes about two packs per day for the past 35 years. He is unemployed as he's unable to hold a job due to his habits. Vitals show blood pressure of 98 over 60, heart rate 105, respirations 20 and shallow, temperature 101.3, saturation 90% on room air. Chest x-ray reveals a cavitating lesion in the right lower lobe with an air fluid level. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A, squamous cell lung cancer, B, non-squamous cell lung cancer, C, aspiration pneumonia and abscess formation, D, lobar pneumonia, or E, mycoplasma pneumonia. So I'll give you a chance to pause it here, and then uh, on the USMLE you'll be expected to answer this and then go on and you won't be able to go back. All right, so question 10 asks, which of the following is the most appropriate management for this patient? A. Piperacillin tazobactam, B. Ceftriaxin azithromycin, C. Ceftriaxin levofloxacin and vancomycin, D. Azithromycin, or E. Multidrug chemotherapy. Okay, so we are going to find out what our diagnosis is here. So our diagnosis is aspiration pneumonia and probably abscess formation based on our findings on chest x-ray. So this is certainly abscess or aspiration pneumonia. And aspiration pneumonia occurs in, really we see it primarily in two groups of patients. One, alcoholics, especially alcoholics who pass out. And this guy is certainly an alcoholic. I mean, he's drinking a ton of vodka every day. Uh, he's drinking to the point where he's unable to hold a job, and so this is clearly an alcoholic. Uh, and then it also happens in patients who are in surgery who maybe don't follow their NPO orders and they eat before surgery and they don't say anything about it, and then you go to intubate them and their gastric contents come up. That's why you make the patient NPO for the night before surgery so that their stomach clears out so if they do start, you know, chucking stuff up, there's nothing in there, and they just have dry heaves, and then they're fine. Uh, so when you're administering general anesthesia, uh, this is one of the risks, aspiration pneumonia. So I could have given a totally different vignette, and you could easily have an aspiration pneumonia in a totally different patient. Uh, but this patient happens to be an alcoholic. He's got all the risk factors, really the, the main uh, features of aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration pneumonia, certainly like all pneumonia, is going to give you a fever. Uh, he's got that. Uh, worsening shortness of breath, uh, pleuritic chest pain, very classic pneumonia picture. He's also got this uh, sputum that looks like blood. What is that? Is that blood? Well, it might be a little blood in it, uh, but this is not your typical hemoptysis that you would see in lung cancer. And, and really, hemoptysis uh, you do see in lung cancer, but you would expect it over a longer period of time. Lung cancer is probably not the diagnosis here because lung cancer findings are more chronic. So if this had been a patient who had been having uh, hemoptysis for six, seven weeks and, and presents now without a fever and, and without uh, worsening, acutely worsening shortness of breath, and he wasn't an alcoholic, but he smoked for the past 35 years, um, and, and his vitals, he didn't have a fever, then that would point you towards a lung cancer. And really, you would not be able to, as far as I know, tell what kind of lung cancer it is without doing a biopsy. Uh, but, but that would be your picture of lung cancer. Uh, so you know it's pneumonia then. Uh, aspiration pneumonia is most likely primarily uh, because of his history, because of his alcoholism, uh, but also because of this, this blood, uh, quote-unquote blood. And what this is, is the classic current jelly sputum that you see in a very particular kind of aspiration pneumonia, and that is that aspiration pneumonia caused from Klebsiella, uh, which is a common pathogen in aspiration pneumonia. Lobar pneumonia is not likely here for two reasons. One, he has more risk factors for aspiration pneumonia, uh, and two, most importantly, he's got this cavitating lesion, and you would not see that in lobar pneumonia. You would see lobar consolidates. Now, you can have aspiration pneumonia and have lobar consolidates, and in that case, you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell the difference, but I wouldn't have given you lobar pneumonia as another answer choice because you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Aspiration pneumonia can easily lead into a lung abscess, whereas lobar pneumonia is really not going to do that. 
And then mycoplasma pneumonia, this tends to be in younger patients. They have fewer symptoms. They call it the walking pneumonia because they are just much less sick. You know, maybe they've got a fever, maybe they're a little short of breath, but otherwise they appear pretty okay. And then you go and get a chest x-ray and you see these patchy infiltrates, kind of uh, peribronchial and perivascular uh, 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 pattern. Uh, of where the infiltrates are. You really, it's hard to diagnose mycoplasma pneumonia on the chest x-ray because you will get findings on the chest x-ray, but they're very inconsistent. So really mycoplasma pneumonia is something you diagnose more on the patient's symptomology or lack thereof, and then their chest x-ray is abnormal. Uh, so this is aspiration pneumonia with abscess formation. Now the fact that he has an abscess is not going to impact our treatment. So what is our treatment? It's Piperacillin tazobactam. So, uh, Piperacillin tazobactam is, is, I mean, there are other drugs that you can use certainly to treat aspiration pneumonia, but Piperacillin tazobactam is a, a, a drug that you will, uh, you will use for this. It's a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combo, and that's really your best approach for these patients if you need to hospitalize them. Uh, and you are going to need to hospitalize this patient because he is possibly uh, septic. Uh, so notice he's 98 over 60. That's getting kind of low. He's got a fever, really not li liking how this patient looks. You're going to want to give him fluid and antibiotics after you get, obviously, antibiotics after you get blood culture. So ceftriaxone and azithromycin would be a good regimen for somebody with like a low bar pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia who needs to be hospitalized or is just older, over 60. Uh, that would be a good regimen to give uh, in, in that case. Ceftriaxone, levofloxacin, and vancomycin would be okay uh, for a patient who is similar to B, uh, so community-acquired pneumonia, older, needs to be hospitalized, but maybe uh, they got the pneumonia while they were in the hospital, or you have any reason to suspect MRSA. Vancomycin is going to be added if you suspect MRSA. Azithromycin oral would be something to give to a, a patient who's got pneumonia but is otherwise pretty healthy, pretty stable, don't need to hospitalize them, going to treat them on an outpatient basis. And then multidrug chemotherapy would be the answer choice that you would have chosen if you had thought that this patient had lung cancer, which he probably does not, but certainly has a lot of risk factors for lung cancer, just not the symptomatology. Aspiration pneumonia is pneumonia resulting from direct chemical and bacterial insult to the lungs. You get the, the, the stomach acid, which really uh, sort of destroys the surrounding tissue and makes it nice and ripe for the bacteria to go in and colonize. Uh, often, aspiration pneumonia is polymicrobial, and it includes anaerobes, so that's going to affect our treatment. We can't just give regular, regular old azithromycin for aspiration pneumonia. We have to uh, choose a different antibiotic. Risk factors, as I said, include alcohol intoxication. Uh, what happens is that these just drinking is not going to cause aspiration pneumonia. It's when you drink and drink and drink and then you pass out and then you go to vomit, but you don't wake up because you're, you're, you're so neurologically suppressed from the alcohol. Uh, and so they wind up aspiring the vomit, and that's what causes the pneumonia. Now, I will say aspiration pneumonia should be distinguished from aspiration pneumonitis, which is not necessarily a bacterial infection. It's a chemical uh, insult to the lungs, and that causes more uh, acute symptoms. It comes on often only a couple hours after, after the, the, the insult. Um, that does not necessarily need antibiotics, but in many cases, aspiration pneumonitis will develop into aspiration pneumonia, so you have to be careful. Loss of consciousness, as I said, that kind of follows with the alcohol intoxication, uh, but any kind of, uh, anything that really depresses you neurologically, if you start puking up from that, then uh, you won't be able to, to uh, get that vomit out, and a lot of times you'll aspirate it. Neuromuscular disorders like stroke, seizures, Parkinson's, MS, is for reasons I'm sure you can imagine, you're, you're aspirating because uh, you're, you're neurologically not intact. Uh, seizures, obviously you're not going to be able to get that vomit out. Uh, so you can see here uh, that there's a variety of neurologic issues that can, that can uh, lead to aspiration pneumonia. Advanced age. 
the risk of aspiration pneumonia is six times higher in people over the age of 75. So you have to look out for that. Immunosuppression, poor dental hygiene, really a, a risk factor for aspiration pneumonia, but also it's, it's something that can cause a whole plethora of other bacteria that colonize uh, the, the teeth if you don't uh, brush them. Uh, if you have poor oral hygiene, uh, you can get some other anaerobes that can affect and that can be a problem. But we're going to take care of all of the bacteria. We're not going to pick and choose here. And then obesity, probably because of the increased pressure and laparoscopic gastric banding. Uh, there's other things like esophageal issues uh, that, that can also be risk factors uh, as well. Uh, things like Zenker's diverticulum. Symptoms include fever, productive cough, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, basically everything you would see in regular pneumonia. Sputum is often described as foul smelling. That's indication that you have anaerobes. And, and then uh, uh, a lot of times it'll be described to you in the test as putrid. Klebsiella, as I mentioned, is a commonly implicated organism which yields a characteristic current jelly sputum. You, there will be two cases where, you, where you'll hear the word current jelly. One will be current jelly sputum that you think of in an alcoholic, aspiration pneumonia, and the other is current jelly stools, which you see in a little kid with intussusception. Diagnosis is clinical and radiographic, pretty much like regular old pneumonia. CBC and culture should be obtained, pretty much like regular pneumonia, but since we know this is aspiration pneumonia, or we have reason to believe this is aspiration pneumonia, it's going to impact our antibiotic therapy, and that's what the USMLE is going to want you to know. So antibiotic therapy should be started as soon as possible after obtaining cultures. Outpatients may be treated with clindamycin. However, a lot of these patients are going to need to hospitalize. And so those patients, you'll want to treat them with beta-lactam and beta-lactamase inhibitors or a carbapenum like mirapenum, ertapenum, etc. A lot of physicians, a lot of the infectious disease doctors that I work with, uh, some of them shy away from the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combos for some reason, which I don't know. Uh, so they'll go to the carbapenems. Uh, but either of these are acceptable on the USMLE, and you will not be asked to choose between the two of these. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't even be asked to choose between these and clindamycin. Uh, but I will just say that if you do use clindamycin, it will only be in the outpatient setting. But you just don't send patients home with aspiration pneumonia very often because a lot of these patients are just really sick. Uh, so aspiration itself, which as you know can come from alcohol intoxication, anesthesia, etc., can cause four different things. It can cause pneumonitis, as we talked about. It can cause necrotizing pneumonia. Uh, it can cause a, uh, which is really aspiration pneumonia. It can cause lung abscess, uh, which we saw in this patient, and then it can also cause an empyema, which is an infection, a purulent infection of the pleural cavity. And you'll be able to see that on x-ray. So this is your, your cavitating lesion with air fluid level. This is consistent uh, with a lung abscess from aspiration pneumonia. Here's another one. So this is not necessarily a lung abscess. Uh, but it is consistent with aspiration pneumonia, given that you've got a consistent clinical history. So this is, we kind of went over this, but this is how uh, you treat a patient with pneumonia. Uh, so if they're ambulatory, not requiring hospitalization, young, otherwise healthy, you can just send them home with oral azithromycin if, uh, and follow up. Uh, if they're ambulatory and don't require hospitalization, but uh, they're over 60 years of age, they have comorbidities, uh, then you'll want to do either an oral beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, so something like, uh, like uh, amoxicillin clavulanate, and then a macrolide. Uh, or you can do an oral antinumococcal fluoroquinolone like moxifloxacin. And then uh, if they require hospitalization, you'll pretty much do the same therapy, but uh, you'll give it IV. Uh, and then uh, for aspiration pneumonia, like I said, you want to do the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, IV. Uh, so piperacillin tazobactam, which was our answer here. Uh, or you can, uh, as I mentioned, you can do carbapenems. Okay, and that's all I've got for you for this set. If you have any questions, please write me a note below. I'll see you next time.